uh, <clears throat> a stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, I've been blessed to have many, many opportunities. And I think the, uh, the long and the short of it is that I have been the beneficiary of great mentorship, sponsorship, and allyship over my career. And that's led me to have uh, extraordinary opportunities. And I'm hopeful that it would be a, a sign that um, in spite of all the challenges we face, uh, we can find a silver lining and maybe some of the lessons I've learned from my, my academic leadership journey would uh, resonate with uh, many of you. So uh, my talk today uh, is uh, thinking about silver linings and hoping that uh, academic leadership can help us lead through these very difficult times. Of course, uh, th this talk is named in honor of uh, Harriet Tubman, as you've heard, who really was an, an icon. But before I I talk about icons. I want to recognize uh, your chairman and the good friend and colleague uh, Wallace Marsh, who was formative in my early career as a trainee at the University of Pittsburgh. And many of you have served in that role uh, over the years. So Wallace is, uh, I knew him as a fellow uh, in a very, very extraordinary time in 1985 till uh, 1990. And now he's going on to be a uh, distinguished uh, compatibility uh, pancreatic surgeon and chair of your department. I also know many others in your midst uh, and I uh, want to shout out, of course, to Gordon, who I was uh, there uh, a number of years ago as an invited lecturer uh, in, on his, uh, in his honor, as well as other friends and colleagues uh, like Vinay Badwar, who now is there, Larry Way, uh, Jeremiah, and of course, these uh, cast of characters who I got to know at uh, The Ohio State University. Uh, again, uh, Clay Marsh and Gail were instrumental in bringing me to Ohio State and uh, ultimately uh, helped me grow and develop along with Dr. Gordon Gee, your president. And he uh, was principal in recruiting me to Ohio State in 2010, all of whom have had formative roles in my career uh, to this point. So I want to say thanks to all of them, and I hope that they are well. As you know, Harriet Tubman uh, is, has a storied history uh, as a uh, proponent of uh, uh, equality and diversity during the Civil War. And she, as, uh, as uh, uh, David mentioned, uh, was un uh, uh, instrumental in helping uh, many, many uh, slaves and uh, uh, freed slaves uh, leave the South uh, th through the Underground Railroad. She also receives credit for uh, serving in the military as a nurse, uh, helping to take care of uh, uh, soldiers and those who were uh, having uh, infection and other problems during their time. She really was instrumental in not only uh, helping people leave uh, diverse uh, and, and difficult times, but she also was an inspiration. And I, uh, I see this quote is attributed to her. I think it really is uh, re remarkable. Uh, and, I, and I read it because I think it's uh, important for all of us to kind of hang on to these kinds of aspirational goals, that every dream begins with a dreamer. And always remember that you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. And I think that's a mantra that uh, many of you there are executing on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's certainly a, a theme for me in my current career here at, in Boston. Uh, and I think it's really important. Again, I was, uh, again, the beneficiary of great mentors and colleagues. And many of them uh, went this journey from Hopkins to the University of Pittsburgh. As many of you know, Dr. Henry Bonson was uh, reportedly one of uh, Alfred Blaylock's favorite chief residents at Hopkins. And he left uh, Hopkins to go to uh, the University of Pittsburgh to build that program in 1962. He was an iconic uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, a, uh, a, a real leader in the field and built a fantastic training program. Of course, he recruited uh, Tom Starzl to be a member of that team. Uh, again, uh, Starzl had spent two years at Hopkins as well. And they formulated a plan to build a, an extraordinary uh, program in general surgery, which we were the beneficiaries of, and many of you were exposed to as well. There's a picture of these uh, three iconic folks, and the person in the middle is Mark Ravitch, another Hopkins uh, luminary who uh, came to um, Pittsburgh to help uh, bring the 
uh, general surgery programs uh, forward here they are in Russia, I believe, bringing stapling technology uh, and discovering it and bringing it to the United States. So they were really remarkable in terms of building a program that was extraordinary. It was also a place of uh, great fun and uh, innovation. And here's uh, Tom Starzl, I mean, many of you may have seen this picture, and Henry Bonson uh, outside of Scape Hall skateboarding. So it was a dynamic time uh, for us uh, as trainees, and we really benefited from great uh, experiences. Here's our intern uh, freshman trip, uh, as it were, uh, whitewater rafting with uh, Dr. Bonson. And he was an avid outdoorsman as well. He loved life and really contributed greatly to our education and our experience. So my goals today are to try to review some of the current affairs influencing academic medical centers, as well as to understand the impact of COVID on the academic life, and hopefully uh, highlight how uh, effective leadership can support our focus on the academic mission and create a better future. It's clear that our brightest dreams and our greatest fears are just over the horizon. And this pandemic over the last two and a half years now has really helped us understand that we have many blessings, but also many challenges. Again, this is just a, you know, a snapshot of all of the kinds of things that have influenced our ability to provide extraordinary care during this time. This is not unlike what happened in 1918 during the pandemic at that, at that point, and it's a great uh, read and a chronicle uh, by John Barry uh, re regarding the great influenza, which outlines specifically what happened during that time period. And it was a devastating pandemic, uh, the likes of, of which had not been seen until very recently, 2020. One of the, one of the I think, messages in this book is that um, leadership has a responsibility to really provide a, a straightforward and an honest opinion of what is happening so that we can maintain the public's trust and uh, not to manipulate the facts, but rather to deal with whatever is coming down the pike. And so uh, only then will people be able to break it apart and ultimately address the issues uh, related to the pandemic. Obviously, these are challenging times. My hope is that there is a silver lining and that we can learn from the lessons over the past two and a half years to make a difference. And so we thought that was the case uh, in uh, December of 2020 when the vaccine became available. Some of the work that was done here at the Brigham with the Moderna vi uh, vaccine as well as the Pfizer vaccine. It's ironic that this picture of the woman who was, uh, I guess, uh, the first person to receive the vaccine um, was a person of color. And yet there continues to be extraordinary concerns and hesitancy not only in the minority, but in the majority about the vaccine and its efficacy. Yet uh, this nurse uh, is reportedly the person who received the first vaccine on December 19th, 2020. And so we've really uh, understood a lot, but we have a lot more to recognize. And the impact of the pandemic uh, is going to linger with us long after 2000 to 2022. As a number of these variants uh, arise, uh, it's unclear which one is gonna come up next. And so the next surge may be a lot like the influenza vaccine. The new norm may be that we have a new one every year, unfortunately, and hopefully our uh, medical infrastructure can develop vaccines to help solve the problem. But it does create significant impact on our patients, our families, and our healthcare systems. And we have to be prepared to deal with this on a regular basis. The most recent surge, uh, as early as uh, the beginning of this month, uh, was representative of the peaks and valleys that we face in this process. But more importantly are the psychological stresses, in my opinion, that really accompany uh, crisis and disasters like this. There are psychological phases of uh, recovery, as well as uh, you know, disappointment and disillusionment, and ultimately the ability to move on after the uh, pandemic has had its impact. And so many of us are going through these kind of cyclic uh, ups and downs, which create psychological challenges, as well as uh, you know, challenge the well-being of our communities. The unintended consequences are obvious for our frontline workers. And this uh, post-traumatic stress uh, uh, syndrome 
really does create a burden for our nurses, our practitioners, our residents. And so we have to really manage that very carefully. So strong leadership during the public health crisis is critical. As we deal with all of these uh, variety of uh, issues, um, because some patients, again, the morbidity, the mortality has been extraordinary, but many of us are struggling with how to lead through this process. From a surgical standpoint, we're trying to get back to a more normal surgical life after the pandemic and the leadership imperative, I'm sure there at West Virginia, as well as here in Boston, is really to think about safe and strategic, as well as thoughtful reinitiation of our surgical activity so that we can get back to 100% capacity in the coming months. Uh, we may or may not need pre-procedural testing, uh, but certainly utilization of uh, protective equipment is important. And of course, vaccination of our population would be ideal, particularly with boosters. Uh, we will eventually get back to more elective procedures. Um, we have to worry about those who are asymptomatic but have positive uh, uh, titers. And again, we have to worry about a resurgence in 2022. So it's likely that the new norm is going to be uh, one of universal precautions, probably more telemedicine, less in-person meetings, fewer big academic meetings, and ultimately limited travel, depending on your risk tolerance. The economic impact cannot be understated in terms of on our healthcare delivery systems as well as our organizations. And we really have to persevere uh, financially as well as uh, with the wherewithal to deal with these problems. So you might get depressed if you were to uh, be disappointed. And yet these difficulties uh, can be, uh, in the pessimist's mind, overwhelming. But as an optimist, and I continue to be optimistic about our future, I think that we can find opportunities in every one of these difficulties. So I use my personal experience in my journey, which often tells a story. My mom and dad met in Nashville when my dad went to Meharry Medical School, and my mom went to Fisk across the street. And they married and uh, moved to uh, uh, Southern California, where I was born, and my dad was in service to the Navy. My brothers and I then moved back to Charleston, South Carolina, where my, my dad was from. And uh, the three boys uh, lived an idyllic life in Charleston, South Carolina until 1964, when it all came crashing down. My dad was killed in a car accident when I was five. My brothers were three and one. He had no life insurance, and my mom sold everything and moved back to upstate New York. We moved in with my grandparents uh, in a two-bedroom apartment and lived there until we could buy a house. Um, my grandparents uh, saved and scraped. My mom worked a couple jobs. And ultimately, uh, they were able to buy a house in a night neighborhood uh, in Albany, New York. Unfortunately, uh, we were not welcomed there and the house was burned to the ground in 1965. So aggression against people of color is not a new phenomenon. And yet we persevered and my parents created opportunities for us. Uh, private military school, all three of us went uh, ROTC for 12 years in order to give us the opportunities and the discipline to be successful in our lives. And that foundation creates, I think, the uh, foundation upon which my leadership journey has been uh, uh, guided. My mom used to say, we're gaining through our losing in our lives. And she ultimately, taught us that to deal with adverse situations, you had to deal with the reality. In spite of what you wanted it to be, this was the message in our home. They encouraged and enabled diversity of thought to bubble up uh, rather than to be top down. And the, 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 the generating consensus by wisdom of crowds was likely to be the best strategy. During chaos and crisis, she oriented us not only to the opportunity and not to look beyond the crisis, but to obviously confront the unavoidable difficult issues that we had to deal with. Now, there are many things that really matter, few that we can control. And what she taught us above all else was that we should focus on the things where there was an intersection between what really was important and what we can control. So I was the beneficiary of many career opportunities 
Loved every job that I ever had, starting at Henry Ford Hospital in 1993 as a transplant director to the Medical College of Virginia, to Rush in Chicago, and the Ohio State University. All great opportunities for me to not only learn, but also to apply the rules that I learned during my time. What I learned also was that there were academic skills, which many people had acquired, but the distinction between academic skills and leadership was obvious. You obviously had to you know, fund your knowledge and have a strong work ethic and be highly motivated to get individual results in this journey. And ultimately that led to the rise of the academic letter. But more importantly, emotional intelligence, the ability to work with others and understand your impact in their lives, as well as to develop a broad range of intelligence and insight was helpful along with a very strong work ethic and a sense of institutional motivation to be successful. And from my perspective, that was a transition, as I'm sure Wallace and others and Benet will say, it really transitioned from not only serving your own best interests, but the institution's interest and ultimately getting institutional results. And quite frankly, managing above, above your rank as well as below. And this 360 degree emotional intelligence is critically important to being effective as a leader in the current academic environment. So what are you thinking about as you look at management versus leadership? The difference, in my opinion, is management is the act of coordinating the efforts of people to accomplish goals or objectives uh, in an efficient and effective way. But leadership requires the ability to influence those around you and enlist their aid and their support to accomplish a common goal. And so these are some of the distinctions for the younger people in the audience where leadership can have a huge impact uh, as opposed to management of a current academic medical center. So there's no greater need for leadership now than in the current sociopolitical environment in which we live. And so I'm gonna shift a little bit and talk a little bit how these leadership skills can help us manage any one of these challenges or these crises, whether it be the pandemic, or some of the socio-political and racial problems that are occurring around us. In the spirit of Harriet Tubman, we understand that these things are not new. And deja vu, of course, uh, from Yogi Berra, is the feeling that one has lived through the present situation before. Obviously, being black in America during the 1900s was a very difficult time. And it turns out that the lived experiences of being black in America is now the point of consternation and concern for many in the majority, primarily because of social media and the real world evidence that there are violations of human rights directed against those who may be most vulnerable based upon their race, their gender, their color, or their sociopolitical background. And these are not new phenomena, as I pointed out in the 1960s. They've been going on for dozens, maybe hundreds of years. It's pretty clear that the current environment is relatively unsupportive for underrepresented minority students and faculty. Structural racism, that complex system by which racism is developed, maintained, and protected, has a significant impact on all of us. It manifests as a lack of diversity in our student and resident and faculty population. It also permeates this culture of discrimination and exclusion based on, in some sense, academic elitism. There are macro and microaggressions which occur for all of us. And ultimately, it limits the ability to find a safe haven or a safe zone to address concerns without fear of ret retaliation or discrimination. These are the challenges that we face. And quite frankly, if you thought it was gone after George Floyd, check out the back uh, hospital uh, street uh, in Boston here two weekends ago. These uh, white supremacists were protesting in the front of the hospital at the Brigham and Women Hospital, my new home, was uh, allowing for white patients to be killed and that it 
handed out flyers of these two young investigators who are trying to work in the diversity space. Just weeks ago, this uh, occurred in Boston. Now, hopefully, better education and a greater understanding of what was really happening would be evident to the rest of the world. In fact, this, uh, this demonstration occurred as a result of a paper that was presented in 2019. And if you look at the facts of the paper, here's the actual publication that they were citing. These young investigators uh, working on health equity and, dis and, and disparities identified racial inequalities in access to specialized heart failure care at an academic medical center, the Brigham. The publication came out uh, as an American Heart Association publication. And here's exactly what they reported. They looked at close to 2,000 patients and found out that Black and Latin uh, uh, descent patients had lower rates of admissions to the cardiology service rather than the general medical service compared to white patients. And they concluded that they believed that this might contribute to worse outcomes for those patients. They suggested that this inequity might in part drive racial inequities for the African-American patients who are admitted more frequently after treatment on a general medical service. And yet they were called out as being racist for preference to persons of color rather than those who were served in their space. So this just tells you how social media and some of the extreme perspectives have tainted our perspective. But if, in the words of Martin Luther King, we're hopeful that we can carve a tunnel of hope through the dark mountain of disappointment, whether through our personal experiences or the experiences in social media or in the socio-political environment in which we live. Ultimately, in order to make a course correction, we really must understand that privilege is invisible to many who have it. For those who have privilege, equality feels like discrimination. Justice will only be served when those who are unaffected, any of you, are as outraged as those of us who are affected by some of these discriminatory activities. So I'm hopeful that uh, we can define some of these concepts to provide clarity about what we're talking about as we move forward, because education, I think, is critical to understanding. So first and foremost, I would say, what are we talking about when we talk about diversity? Many people characterize it as black versus white. But in fact, diversity, in my opinion, is the diversity of people, but it's also about thought and experience and inclusion of all members of our medical community. From my perspective, it's vital to the fulfillment of our profession's purpose of critical inquiry and discovery. And it implicates virtually every component of our academic research and service missions. So to understand diversity, we often have to define it more clearly. Diversity focuses, in my opinion, on a representation. It's the collective mixture of characterized differences. They are not only racial, but they also could be socioeconomic and language and religion and sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as ability status. It's the diversity of all things that have an impact in our lives. Inclusion, on the other hand, focuses on involvement. The practice of encouraging and belonging, inviting those to participate and celebrating their differences. So you might characterize diversity as being invited to the party, Whereas inclusion is being asked to dance at the party, participation being the operative word. Many people confuse equity and equality, and they are two strategies that we use in an effort to produce fairness. Equality is treating everyone the same. It aims to promote fairness, but it can only work if everyone starts from the same place and has the same needs for assistance. Equality 
as I stated, but equity is giving everyone what they need to be successful. And so this caricature, I think it points it out pretty clearly. The reality is we all have different levels of uh, station in life. Our hope is to liberate us from all of these challenges and create opportunities through programs that produce fairness, either health equity and or equality of treatment. It's further uh, my opinion that uh, if diversity of our healthcare workforce could actually save lives, shouldn't we be considering the current circumstances of the public health crisis in the same way that we create manuals for success of navigating the pandemic as a public health crisis, so too then should we consider racism as a public health crisis as well. And this is a, 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 a means to think about how to respond to some of these problems. The overwhelming opinion is that alleviating the healthcare disparities issues is gonna require a multifaceted approach, which includes not only access, but improves cultural competency among providers, increases public initiatives and funding, more research targeted at more minority specific issues, and increasing our diversity of our healthcare workforce. This is really gonna be the challenge it, that we face in order to try to eliminate healthcare uh, disparities. And this was well documented by the Institute of Medicine in 2003 in a report that looked at disparities and basically said that racial and ethnic minorities receive worse healthcare than non minorities, and that both explicit and implicit bias played a specific role. This is evident looking at healthcare disparities along ethnic lines. Uh, as this graph depicts, life expectancy has increased for both Caucasians and African-American men and women over the past 35 years. But there's still a five-year gap between men and women uh, and a seven-year gap between men of color and white men. So this is significantly uh, impacting long-term outcomes. And that gap hasn't changed much over the past several years. If we think about social determinants of health, this is a, a reference from a paper that was uh, published in 2018. And it's a heat map looking at some of these communities which deal with socioeconomic and other access issues. And what we find is that these communities in the red are distressed communities. And distressed communities metrics were defined as things like educational attainment, housing vacancy, unemployment, poverty, changes in employment, and ultimately the lack of businesses to support employment successfully. So these are the communities which are struck by not only healthcare disparities, but also significant socioeconomic barriers. I've been fortunate to work uh, to translate some of the experiences I've had in places like Detroit and Richmond and the west side of Chicago and Baltimore to learn from my experiences. And I, I would say for the young people in the audience, uh, as you start out your career, my hope is that you would uh, be on the journey to become a clinical expert and then developing a research interest or a focal point. In my case, it was health disparities in the transplant and cardiovascular space, and to identify those around you with a common interest. And many of you on this call are part of that team that ultimately led to a successful uh, mentorship team in, in my academic career. This led to uh, not only drawing upon my clinical experience to create publications on disparities, but ultimately led to leadership opportunities where I could help others grow and develop in this context. It's pretty clear that these disparities in cardiovascular care have many, many potential culprits. Some of them may be distrust between the doctor and the patient relationship between black and white. Some doctors may be caring uh, for populations that they're basically overwhelmed in. They may not have adequate resources. They may or may not deal with patient populations that are well-informed. 
There may also be racism among doctors and racial insensitivity of the patients that they care for. But ultimately, we know that there's a disparity in terms of the number of underrepresented minority cardiovascular specialists. In the communities that serve these minorities, uh, it's pretty clear that there's lots of metrics that demonstrate, particularly in patients with heart disease, that the care is not equitable. They have longer balloon to uh, door to balloon times. They have uh, delays in getting defibrillation and cardiac arrests. They have a higher level of amputations. They may not be working with highly credentialed doctors and they tend to have lower procedural volumes. All of this data coming from the literature. I've been focused on looking at uh, databases as early in my career as in the early 2000s, looked at over 35,000 heart transplant recipients from the UNOS database. And what we saw during that period of time was that uh, white recipients had a much better morbidity and less mortality than black recipients. And patients were likely to die from graft failure even if they were matched appropriately. Some people thought because there was a racial discordance in terms of the donor and recipient match that that would have an impact. But it turns out regardless of what the race is of the donor, donor a recipient discordance did not have an impact so much as the race of the recipient. And this graph demonstrates that African-American patients had worse outcomes. And even if they're bridged to transplant using mechanical circulatory support, and over 6,000 patients that were reviewed from the UNOS database, we recognize that African-American patients had an increased risk of graft failure after transplantation even if they were bridged successfully with left ventricular assist devices. They had increased mortality at five years after implant. So these are challenges that we face in understanding the disparities issues going forward. And even in a current uh, paper that we published last year, looking at over a million patients from the SDS database who underwent coronary bypass surgery from 2011 to 2018, Black patients still had higher overall mortality compared to white patients. And women also had higher risk of dying after cabbage. And so we saw that the race and sex disparities persisted in the post-drug eluding era. Uh, and so we should really focus on not only the biologic impact, but also the socioeconomic and the cultural multi-level factors. So this is a real challenge because if you look at where patients get their care, it's pretty clear that they have disparities not only in the kind of care they receive, but the local uh, expertise in the environment. There's a paper that points out that uh, patients uh, from lower socioeconomic status uh, environments end up getting care in places that really don't have the kinds of uh, level of care that we hope. So it's pretty clear then that if in fact we make this case, it's possible that a more diverse workforce could improve patient care and save lives of those most affected by cardiovascular disease and cancer. Unfortunately, if we look at the US biomedical workforce, it still is a challenge. This is early data looking at uh, the, the diversity of our workforce from the 1990s into 2015. It's pretty clear that still we need to diversify our workforce in a different way from a gender standpoint and from a racial and ethnic standpoint. But it's clear that if we could do that, that uh, good things would happen when people of different backgrounds, different cultures and ethnicities come together to work towards shared goals and common interests. Unfortunately, the educational attainment of young people in communities of color really lags far behind. You would have to ask the question, what would you do without a high school diploma in the current environment or even a college degree? And what we find out is that uh, this is the data looking at the percentage of men of color graduating from high school, going on to college, potentially getting uh, degrees in science or engineering, and advancing in science and engineering, only about 4% of the African-American male population actually 
has adequate educational attainment to serve the needs of our society. Really a striking uh, evidence of a uh, challenge. So proud to say that as part of the American College of Surgeons call to action on racism, uh, they understood that there was an ethnic imperative. They're committed to creating a more just and inclusive environment to continue the research and public health initiatives addressing health disparities. And they made a commitment to accelerate legislative reform to help improve these outcomes. Challenging as it may be, if you look at the numbers, it really is uh, extraordinary still as we try to modernize our workforce. This is data from uh, Paris Butler in 2006 that looks at the percentage of African-American and Latino faculty and tenured professors in surgery. And we see the number is somewhere between 1.5 and 3% of our faculty and staff are uh, people of color. And that really is a challenge even if we look at the modern uh, distribution, are still our racial counts in trainees is well below 10%. And those in the professoriate are less than 10%. And so we still got plenty of work to do if you look at the proportion of full-time surgical faculty who are black in most academic medical centers. Harris also proposed that maybe we should think more broadly about this and propose policy alternatives to increase the number of underrepresented minority academic surgeons by considering medical student recruitment, uh, preceptor programs, and interviewing uh, more broadly for open positions that exist in our environment. But we still are challenged. Uh, the, still the number of uh, underrepresented minorities in a current series in 2018 demonstrates that Black and Hispanics make up somewhere between three and 5%, whether you go from general surgery residents to assistant professors, to associate professors, to full professors. So there is some hope uh, that women have had uh, some gains in terms of uh, affiliation in departments of surgery around the country. And we recognize uh, K. Marie King and uh, Andrea Hayes Jordan as the, the latest uh, new program uh, leaders as department chairs. These are the two women who have uh, stepped into these roles this year. It's pretty clear what the roadmap is to success. And these two accomplished women have really taken on at Albany and Howard uh, the, the, the leadership mantle. Uh, Paris also outlined pretty clear roadmap for how to achieve uh, academic distinction to become division heads and program leads, as well as department chairs. So the, the pathway forward is clear. The opportunities are more challenging. And so you wonder why some of these diversity programs fail. If you look at uh, the Harvard Business Review, it's pretty clear that we, our goal is to reduce bias and increase diversity but we've been using the same paradigm since the 60s and 70s. Most of these programs focus on the manager's behavior, as well as uh, not only uh, changing the culture. Sometimes if you focus on these things too uh, acutely, it energizes resistance, as we saw just a couple weekends ago, and people become pretty defensive. So we're trying to uh, hopefully increase contact with uh, women and minorities and tap into the desired uh, outcomes going forward um, through mentoring programs and ultimately limiting uh, implicit bias. So just a mention about that because I think um, it would be uh, erroneous to not call out implicit bias as an important factor. As you all know, it's a preference for a social group that is both unconscious and automatic. And we all have them, black, white, purple, green, men, women. We all have some bias in how we interact based upon our backgrounds. Ultimately, it informs how individuals experience and perceive others. Our hope is that we can manage our bias 
by calling it out. And uh, these are just a few of the rules that we use to apply in our environment, hopefully to consider diverse opinions and to recognize that people have different levels of experience and can express it in different ways. Uh, we need to be thinking unconventionally and ultimately check our assumptions at the door. So strategies to overcome bias include uh, multicultural competency programs, as well as enhancing the diversity of our workforce and enriching the pipeline of those who come through our ranks. And uh, ultimately we can transition to be more effective. There is this concept of microaggressions which generate as much stress as overt racism um, for those who are in the minority. They contribute to not only to uh, individuals lower self-esteem, but they also create uh, a sense of depression and anxiety among some of those folks who work in our environments. Uh, and so we really need to be aware that it's a psychological and physical toll that is exerted on those who are subject to these microaggressions, those little paper cuts. Now and then somebody says something kind of off color or offline, and ultimately that has a huge impact. So if you are in the company of uh, someone who um, speaks uh, in, in an inappropriate fashion, and you're supporting those who are from uh, diverse backgrounds, there are three common missteps to avoid. First of all, being silent. What we're hopeful is that you respectfully pull them aside and speak to them regarding their concerns that, or the comments that they made, and ultimately not becoming defensive if it's pointed out to you, and ultimately coming from a place of understanding uh, as well, we shouldn't overgeneralize. Uh, these are all important things to kind of worry about. But there's clearly unintended consequences about some of these microaggressions, which has an impact on those people of color. It's this concept of uh, the imposter syndrome, my colleague uh, Juanita Merchant from medical school suggested that this creeps in as self-doubt. And if it recurs over and over again, uh, some students and faculty of uh, you know, accomplished uh, environments leave academic ranks because they feel like they're not uh, welcomed. And so we need to make sure that the system is more sensitized and supportive of students and faculty who may be subject to these problems. So uh, as I uh, summarize, uh, what strategies to work? Well, obviously, medical school uh, recruitment programs that target women and minorities, uh, creating contact between different groups and socialization, as well as mentorship, sponsorship, and allyship. Professional organizations are leading a lot of these uh, charges, thinking about uh, making sure you in include a diverse candidate pool for every applicant that uh, position that's open, and this concept of inclusive leadership and Inclusive excellence. Inclusive excellence uh, is defined by the AAMC as the recognition that an academic community or an institution's success is dependent on how well it values, engages, promotes, and includes a rich diversity of students, staff, faculty, administration, and alumni as part of its group. And so what, what we can do is diversify our early pipeline, increase the number of applicants to medical school and many other programs. This is just an example of a program we had at Hopkins with the Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys. Many of these young men came from uh, difficult environments in inner city Baltimore, but seeing faculty and staff who were committed to help them made a world of difference in, I believe, their experience and their vision for what they could accomplish in the future. So we've seen some very impressive results among women in uh, fields that have been underrepresented over the years. And this is a picture of the women in thoracic surgery at one of their early meetings when there were just a few women in the field. And uh, most recently in 2020, at our uh, annual meeting, we see the growth and development of this with intentional strategic recruitment, mentorship, and sponsorship. And so I think it can have a huge impact 
uh, with uh, racial and ethnic diversity as well. It's never too early to start. And these are uh, a group of young people that we sponsored in my, my wife's class of uh, young kids that she was uh, looking after. Uh, it's never too early to invest in these young people. And the point is made that uh, ultimately they can see what potentially they could live and grow up to be uh, through the uh, progressive steps in the educational space. Once folks arrive in our environments, we need to make sure that we recruit and retain them, provide professional and leadership development, and make them feel like they are part of the equation of success in our environment. Sponsorship is critically important. Local uh, activities at uh, schools all helps to fuel the, the fires for this extraordinary effort. And so I'll close with the idea that allyship is the practice that we all can emphasize. Social justice and inclusion as well as human rights on behalf of the members of an in-group can help to advance the interests of those who have been marginalized over the past. Everyone has the ability to be an ally because it really is intersectional. And it is a process of lifelong relationships as many of you have created with me of trust and consistency as well as accountability so that I feel welcome and uh, supported in your, your environments. It has to be recognized as an important and conscious effort, but an opportunity to grow for all of us, not just those in the minority. So it's pretty clear that the sponsorship concept has power. And many young people, as they move up in an organization, recognize that someone with leverage in the organization that can make things happen can often create opportunity for them and it ultimately will be more effective if they have a sponsor. So as I close, I want to say thank you again for the invitation uh, to recognize that we can make a course correction, uh, particularly in our surgical legacy, but across our academic medical centers. The legacy of surgery has been outstanding in patient care, medical innovation, and education. Our goal for every student, resident, and faculty member particularly underrepresented minorities, but not exclusive to them, is to create a future where they can continue to be part of the environment and they can be seen, heard, and valued. I believe we can overcome overt and unconscious bias, but it will require active listening and strategic action. And we all need and benefit from role models, allies, mentors, and sponsors with a focus on inclusive excellence in patient care, innovations, and surgical training, we can and will create a more diverse and inclusive environment and ultimately save lives. With that, I'll say thank you and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions uh, that the audience may have. So thanks again, Wallace, for the invitation and Doug, as well as all my friends there, uh, appreciate all that you've done for me in the past and look forward to uh, hearing more about what's going on at uh, West Virginia. So thank you so much. Hi. How are you? I'm good. That was fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> sure. We'll try to, to uh, take a few questions either through the chat. Um, or if people want to just ask, and I'll relay those on to Dr. Higgins. Okay, great. Bob, can you hear me? This is Wallace Marsh. So uh, Dr. Marsh has something to say. Bob, can you hear me? He can't hear us, Dr. Marsh. So I have him on, have him on my cell phone. I'll just put it in the chat. Okay. So people are- oh, Sorry. I can, I can hear you fine, David. Yeah, by cell, right? I can hear you on your cell, yes. Yeah. So people are putting messages in the, in the chat for you. I see and lots of good, I see lots of good friends there. I see Gulam Abbas. Uh, Dr. Hanga here. Oh, uh, great, yeah, yeah. 
really great. Well, you have quite a group there. So let me ask you, um, how do you accelerate the solution to increase diversity in healthcare delivery, which, you know, as you said, would, would seem to have a great impact on uh, changing outcomes? Well, I think it's a multi-tiered, as I said, uh, approach. The, the, the research uh, is the proof of concept. Um, we're de de developing um, programs that broaden our horizons, community uh, well-being, primary care, uh, reduction in uh, risk factors for cardiovascular and cancer. Um, we've got a program, for instance, in um, um, promoting uh, colonoscopy uh, in the uh, African-American community, which uh, is a, a significant problem. We've got a blood pressure uh, modification, diabetes modification. All of these programs help to assist uh, reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer uh, among those people who historically have not taken advantage of preventative strategies to uh, reduce their risk and identify problems as they go forward. I don't know if you can hear that, David. Yep, perfect. Other questions, residents, students? So I guess uh, I'm curious what your thoughts were when uh, you were at at the Brigham for just barely a month, I think, and those protesters showed up uh, that uh, obviously predated your interest in arriving there, but uh, uh, how did that come across? Well, I think, as my mom said, it, it was an opportunity for us to educate based upon the data, the facts. That's why I showed that article. We uh, widely discussed the how the data was informing practice and why it was so important to recognize. They falsely assumed that because we were um, improving access to cardiology care for people of color, that somehow it was a deficiency to white patients. That was the furthest thing from the truth. The, 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 the literature demonstrated that if we improved cardiology for both black and white patients, that the morbidity of heart failure would be reduced. And so we used that as a, as a platform to emphasize better heart failure care for all of our patients. So I saw that as an opportunity to dispel the, uh, the social media and the uh, you know, kind of the neo-Nazi kind of demonstration. And we sold that to our, our colleagues in the, in the lay press, as well as in the, and emphasize that in uh, the medical literature. And so I think it also, we, uh, we uh, emphasize that for our employees and our practitioners. So I think that was the issue. It's as if people think that healthcare is a zero sum game. It is not a zero sum game. 